Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our great audience. You're welcome once again, Mrs. Awoshika. And yes. uh, as we like to do, I'm going to be asking people where they're joining from right now. Let's know where you're joining from. Where are oh, good? Where are we joining from today? Where are we joining from? Let's know. Let's know. Right. Yes, 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 yes. Where are we joining from? Lagos, Enugu, Lagos, Port Harcourt, Cano, Washington, D.C. I'm here in Florida. <laughs> Abuja, Tim California, Port Harcourt. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Akure, beautiful. Just lovely, lovely. Lagos, Las Gidi, <laughs> Leki Abel Kuta, the Gateway State, Ogu State, my state, <laughs> Abuja, Lagos, Eco UK, lovely, lovely, lovely. You're all, all welcome once again. How many of us have been around for the past three days? How can you people just? Just to put up your, your thumb, thumbs up if you've been around for the past three days. As in, you came for the first, the second, and today's the third. How has it been? It's been amazing. Thank you so, so, so much. Amazing. Ah, we've had such lovely, lovely speakers. It's just been great. Thank you. Inspiring. Lovely. Thank you all so much. Honestly, I feel so blessed, so happy. And today I have another guru in the house, Mrs. Ibuku Awoshika. Before I introduce her properly, I think the last two days we had just a little activity. We had some activities to start. The first day we looked at what kind of animal would like to be as leaders. It was very interesting. Yesterday we had an anagram and um, some people were able to unravel it and they actually, uh, I believe they, the gift will be sent to them. Today, I'm going to have some quick fire questions, but really those fire questions are for my guest. <laughs> my guest speaker, Mrs. Ibuka, well, she can't get ready. They are quick fire questions. Just okay. to get to know you a little bit better. I'm sure people are here and they know you, but they don't really know you. So we want to get to know you better. You know you can wear this very serious face. <laughs> so people want to get to know you better. Yes, Kerry Adele, we're so excited. We're all excited to have Mrs. Awoshika in the house. But before we go, I want everybody to ask this question to answer this quick question right now. Just put it in the chat box. What are you most thankful for today as we speak? What are you most thankful for? What are you, for life, life, good health, ah, life, family, grace and mercy. Life, people, the gift of life. What are you most thankful for? What are you most grateful for? To be alive and in sound health, for salvation, for God's love. Beautiful, keep them coming. I want to see for health, gift of life and family, for a loving family, life and good health. Sanity of mind. A lot of people don't have soundness of mind. And they don't even, they, they can't help it. Grace and mercy, God's mercy. Lovely, 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 lovely. His mercies, contentment. Ah, good health and protection. Healthy family. Some people are thankful for Dr. Awoshika right now. <laughs> <laughs> My job, that's lovely. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, our great audience. Lovely family. Thank you so much, our great audience. I'm going to start with you, sis. Yes. What are you most thankful for at this very hour? Just some quick 
just to get to know you. Better. At this hour and for all times, for me, is the salvation of my soul. Salvation. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay. Because that's what guarantees everything else. Every other thing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's lovely. Okay. Another, you know, quick fiery questions. Um, male or female, which one would, have, would you have preferred to be? I love being a girl. <laughs> Totally no, love it. Why? Why? Oh, I love the jewelry. <laughs> I love the color. I love uh, being powered when I can. Yeah, I love being a girl. I, I think it's just such a dynamic. You know, everybody gets carried away with, oh, you know, I'd love to be a man. But it's such a narrow mm. field in terms of, you know, the persona and the mm. profile of being a man. But mm. because we see power through the eyes of men, yeah. we tend to think I'd rather be a man. Interesting. What, yeah. <laughs> Please go on. The, what I was going to say is, you know, the power that women have is mm. actually greater than what a man can hold on to. Mm. Because the power of influence, mm. the person with the highest power of influence is a woman. Um, and she, she would influence every man whether it's her son or ah. her husband or anybody in her sphere. Mm. And mm. that combined with the fun of being a girl, you know, I can it's wear all the colors in the world. The without, color. I can wear jewelry <laughs> without, you know, uh, feeling. There's just, it's, there's just so much to the life of being a woman if you understand what your calling is. Absolutely. And you, you find the liberty to be all of you. Mm. You will enjoy being a woman in every sense. And the interesting thing is on the platform of chat box, a lot of women are saying, oh, I'm glad to be a woman. And the men are saying, I'm trying to be a man. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're it's... all happy in our, in our shoes. Okay, so it's favorite color. I know what it oh, is. Oh, yellow. There's yellow, no... I remember you said it once. Yellow. Yeah, I love the sunshine. Why? Why I, I, I like nice and bright. <laughs> things you know i just love the sunshine i love daytime i love light it's just you my know. favorite color as well so i remember when you said it i never never forgot favorite yeah. food uh food i'm not a foodie <laughs> but you know maybe sweet potato and uh okay. vegetables, something okay. like that. i like easy food mm. you know i love ogi it's <laughs> that simple you know i'm just a lazy eater <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I want to eat things I can eat easily and no stress. I thought I was the only one. I would say to my daughter sometimes, that, ah, eating this salad is like work. <laughs> because I, I have to that and all those yeah. things. All yeah. right. Favorite TV show of all time? I wouldn't say one. Just all the crime investigative programs. <laughs> those are my favorite things. I love, you know, it's a very... I think one of the best ways to develop your strategic mind mm. is watching the process of solving a problem, especially mm. in crime, because usually you're starting from zero mm. and you're building up to mm. uh, a solution. I love just the thinking that goes behind this. I watch all the, um, all the different crime. I mean, but, I'm an addict of but, all the crime series and everything. How come you didn't start long? Yeah, I, I, at a point in time, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but then obviously it's clear that what I used to watch in all those legal things is not the same as real life of law in Nigeria. So I probably would <laughs> never have enjoyed it as much. But at a point, I really was fascinated with the thought of being a lawyer. That's amazing. Just two more questions. What's the most historical place you've ever been to anywhere in the world? Nigeria, abroad, anywhere? Wow, I'm trying Sorry. to remember which one of them is the most historical. Greece. Greece, okay. Jordan. Okay, you know, okay, okay. Because okay. I've been to the Black Sea to see that, oh. and you sort of remember all the things about mm. uh, Black Sea, biblical history mm. and all mm. of that. And then Greece, when you go to all those historical sites, I I've seen know. I've seen a few in my I mean one drive of the that. world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, you know, I remember when we were at Ife, there's this, you know, Ikogo Sea, 
Where have you ever been to those places? What's yeah, I know in Togo. I remember Togo is in Ekiti yeah. somewhere. Yeah. So somewhere where the hot water and the cold. Because sometimes in Nigeria we actually do have those places. We do. Yeah. We do. Uh, yeah. Togo is warm spring. Warm That's spring. Yes. Um, warm spring. Yes. Okay. The last question. No, second to last. What song always puts you in a good mood? Or maybe I should ask. Mr. Woshika. <laughs> Honestly, I'm an SU girl. You know, uh, <laughs> I know that's one of your yeah, favorite songs. Those, those are my songs. I just, <laughs> honestly, I think there's just such immense joy that comes from being able to touch the throne of grace. Mm, you know, mm. Just the songs that bring your heart you know, and sort of lays it before God mm. and helps you to communicate mm. what it is that, you know, half the time we have so many unspoken thoughts mm. and then you just hear one song and it just sort of helps you there, mm. you know, and then there's this um, Nathaniel Bassi song I love as well, but it, it's simply because it helps me to express to God what I really feel about my journey of life as in laying it at his feet you know is is that song um take the stage lord right. have your way mm. i'm just a vessel nothing more and when you're done please take the glory Glory. i'm satisfied just to see you glorified it sort of expresses my heart cry because, you know, everything I do, I hope to God that the things I do with my life, with my time, mm. bring him glory, but more than that, brings him joy mm. and satisfaction, yeah. you know, and then that excites me, just the, the thought of that. So that's a song that I almost move from zero to the mm. top of the mountain very quickly when, when, when I sing that. Nothing. So the very last question is, what's the best advice you've ever received? I think it wasn't so much from a person. It was a revelation sort of from just listening or reading books. And, and that's to be true to myself. Mm. It's my most one thing that no matter what class I'm teaching, no matter what I'm doing, I will bring it out. Mm. Because I realized that the best thing I will ever do in my life is be true to myself, live my true life mm. by being honest about my options, my decisions, my choices, and never. So I don't want to live anybody else's life. Mm. I don't want to be anything because that's what somebody else thinks I should be. Mm. At the end of the day, I want to be satisfied. You know, my biggest dream in life is to die empty. Mm, mm, and mm. to die empty, I have to live all of the life that is in me. Mm. And mm. so if I'm not true to myself, my choices will always be twisted or upturned by other people's uh, mm. voices. Mm. And no matter how many voices, you know, one of my key things in my belief system is that even though the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety, the way I interpret it always mm. is that safety uh, in the multitude of counsel and the multitude of counsel, you're receiving information. Mm. Absolutely. But all the information that you receive is to guide you to make the decision. The decision making is all on you. Mm. And mm. you must be accountable for the decision that you make. So mm. if I want to be true to myself, I can receive all the counsel, but I'm, I always take it back as information. It gives me a 360 degree view of this mm. situation. Mm. But the responsibility for the decision I make is all mine. And it has to align with whatever it is I consider my journey. Mm. And mm. I must be true to myself in making that choice. So sometimes people will not understand why you will make a particular choice. Mm. So there's oh. all this message about volume. I think exactly. people can 
that um my Abba sister had the eyes, so I, I, it's not it's from me. I doubt it. Because I can hear you very clearly. Well, yes, I put it at the highest. It's okay at this end. So, uh, so, so that means it must be that person should check yeah. their own system and increase the volume on their system. Okay. Many people say they can hear clearly. So, yeah. okay. So that's that's my my understanding of that. And that's it's so loaded, and we haven't even started. And uh, you've given us some real lovely, lovely nuggets. And once again, I want to welcome our audience. I want to welcome you to the um, third day, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, the summit. Um, we've had amazing days. Um, on Saturday, we had um, Didi Unneli and Yemisi Edu. On uh, Monday, yesterday, we had um, Tony Bakari. Today, we have Mrs. Zibukwa. Which can, some might wonder, why this summit? Why, why, Kenny did you decide to do this summit? And it's a summit around leadership. And a leader is who I am, is what I do, is what I've studied. It's what I know. John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. I have had people ask me several times about my journey, which is why I decided to bring in thought leaders, other leaders who have been able to navigate, you know, the very complex journey of leadership to come and share the experience with us. One aspect that I have over the years also seen that we do not focus on a lot. And it honestly <laughs> surprises me. It's this issue of building a leadership pipeline. It's the issue of succession. I look at it and when I did some research, you would find out that the only industry probably that really regulates succession planning and when we talk about succession planning, some people think we're only talking about the CEO of the company or the owner, the founder. The CB and the banking industry is the only one that is so clearly regulated. And what they've done is to give them a framework. So you'll find that most banks have succession planning, you know, as part of the um, strategies for the future. My question is, whatever industry you are, whatever business you are in, is it something that you think about? When last did you ask any leader, and I would even like answers to this in the chat box. When last did you ask any leader in your company, who's going to lead next after you? When last did you have the occasion on your team, on your team, you are the leader on your own, you're, you're leading a team. Maybe your company can be this, uh, you know, a, 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 a department. It can be a subsidiary. When last did you ask that question? Who are you grooming to take over from you? It is something that we just, we just keep going. We keep going. We never look back at our bench strength. I, or since the beginning of the, of, the, of the summit, I've used the, the recently concluded ACON as an example. Because when we talk about bench strength, it's very easy to relate it to, 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 to sports. Imagine that during the AFCON, maybe the Nigeria-South Africa game, someone gets injured, what happens? The bench strength, immediately they get somebody to go and fill up fill up the position. Imagine that the person that's going to fill up or take over that position has not been trained. Is it on the pitch, the coach will say, no, do it this way, do it that way. But that is exactly what we do. We have so much in us as leaders, but we're not passing it on. We're not grooming people. And that is the reason for this um, summit and the focus of this, of the, on, and, the, and the reason for the title of this summit. So what is succession planning? Succession planning is simply a future 
future-oriented strategic process. Note, future-oriented strategic process. What happens is that we are also consumed with the now, with our corporate strategies at the moment, our vision, the organizational goals, our long-term, and we neglect the most important thing. David Arger of the uh, Harvard Business School says, Succession planning is as important, if not more important, than your corporate strategy. We are not intentionally trying to identify people for the critical roles in our organizations. We are not preparing them for when any vacancy, either planned or unplanned, happens. Yet we have put so much into our businesses. As heads of teams, we have put so much into our teams. I'm talking from experience because this is what happened to me in the, at the you know, beginning of my company. You would just do what you call leadership placement. You will employ this person and, and, and that person. We're not focusing on the internal talents that we have and grooming them. So I remember getting ahead of school once. Oh, she came from the UK. She hadn't really been prepared, but I saw she had potential and I put that her there and she struggled. And that was when I learned that really we must put, we must develop this pipeline of leader. And to the glory of God today, I can see it working for me. It's working in so many ways. First of all, I can expand. Ms. Zawashika says she wants to die empty. I can actually do that because I can, you know, tap into other graces and gifts God has given me. To the glory of God, we started just as a school. Today, we're a group of companies. And I say that we now, to the glory of, we have the College of Education. We have a resource company. We have a bakery. We have, we are doing so many other things. Why? Because I tapped into empowering leaders. When, put, when um, uh, the pandemic happened, it happened that I was locked down in the US. I didn't know that they were going to shut the borders. Six months I was here, but because of succession planning, because of grooming that pipeline, the schools went on perfectly. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I'm not talking about when you expand, things go down. I'm talking about expanding and I can give ourselves as an example, and our children are still passing 100% pass rate to the glory of God. And my question now, and I want people to note this down. I want you to write who you will be asking on Monday. Today is, today is Wednesday. You still have tomorrow and Friday. Who, not one name that you're going to be asking on either tomorrow or Friday, that who is going to lead next in your department? We are not asking that question. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, who best than Mrs. Awushika to talk about this? First of all, let me say, sis, you know, I say to you all the time, you're a role model to me. <laughs> and to a lot of us, because we've also seen you go through some tough times. We have seen you go through tough times and look at when all those things happened with the chairmanship, first bank, and, and look at you today. Look at how you were able to weather it and use it as a stepping stone. You are an inspiration to me and a lot of other women. And we thank God for, for the God in your life. And that is why I believe that you are more, more than, you know, uh, uh, capable of talking and, and just training us. You're doing so many other things right now. Even when you were, you know, involved in all the other things you were doing, you, you've always had the chair center. I know because I know where you started, where you build the building, you know, it's on the way to my school. You've always, you've always had that. And it's still until today. So um, I'm going to read her, um, her bio very quickly. Um, Ibukwa Woshika is an African entrepreneur, author, international leader, and a global culture shaper. 
She is the founder of the Chair Center Group and the leading furniture and security systems provider in Nigeria. She is the founder of Ibukwa Woshika Leadership Academy, the convener of the International Women Leadership Conference in Dubai, and also the founder of the Christian Missionary Fund, a faith-based organization spread across Nigeria to change lives. She is a woman of many firsts. She is the first chairperson of the Nigerian National Advisory Board for Impact Investing, the first female chairman of Nigeria's Premier Bank, First Bank, the first Nigerian recipient of the prestigious International Women Entrepreneurial Challenge Award, and the first African recipient of the International Friendship Award 2019 by the Queen of Spain. Wow. <laughs> She's committed to serving nations. She was recently appointed to the UK G7 Impact Tax Force and the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. She is a member of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group and served on the pioneer board of the Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Her recent recognitions are the 2020 Forbes Women Africa Chairperson Award and the Better Gamma Signa 2020 Business Achievement Award. She is a fellow of the African Leadership Initiative, Aspen Global Leadership Network, I could go on and on, and a recipient of several honorary doctorate degrees. She is, and she talks about it all the time, happily married to Abiodu Awoshika, a great man, by the way. <laughs> and are blessed with three wonderful sons. Can we just give her a standing ovation? Let's yeah. just Thank yes, you. yes. I want to see it in the chat. You know the the <laughs> yes, I've seen the power hands, claps, flowers. I appreciate the support in her life. Thank you. We thank God. Um yeah. I remember really any great effect people here. Great effect. Great. <laughs> great. <laughs> great too. I remember then, I know that, you know, you were like, you were my senior, but I think it was Mose or something. We were there and I would see yeah. you. And I think you were also doing some courses with some of my friends and, and things like that. So um, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here today. So I'm going to go right into it now. Um, we've told a little bit about your journey, but I know people are really um, eager to hear a bit more. Can you just tell us a bit more about your leadership journey so far before we then talk about how you've been able to groom other leaders? Thank you okay. very much, Dende. And uh, I just want you to know that you're doing an amazing work with the school and with everything else. And you are a role model to many other women as well. So congratulations for the work that you do. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I, I sort of got kicked in early with that, maybe even from secondary school, sort of, because um, unusually I went to Methodist Girls High School, which I'm forever proud of. And um, unusually for... Uh, even then, in my fourth year, rather than my fifth year, I was a deputy house captain for my house in school. And you have to be in fifth form to be in that position, but for whatever reason. So I sort of got an early start. And then when I got into university, if you remember JC's in IFE, mm -hmm. Junior Chambers International, I think I spent all my years in university as a very serious member of the Junior Chambers International, JCS was everything. It was my main distraction in university. <laughs> and, um, and Junior Chambers is a leadership development organization for mm. uh, young people. Well, for people from ages 18 to 40. And mm. I sort of got in, you know, at the 18 point and uh, spent all the years, I could have been distracted doing many things, but spent all my distractive hours on JCs. And that was critical for mm. my nurturing in terms of um, 
my concept of leadership and the value system that, that went with it. You know, when people are planning for the summer, I used to try and manage my time or make no demand on my parents except to go for JC's World Congress anywhere it was in, in the world. And so I, I got an early start to sit in rooms where I listened to great leaders. I remember uh, going to Colombia. I don't know what year I was in university, going to Colombia and listening to Edward Heath talk. But they used to have a program called the Hour of Power. And mm -hmm. they'll have one global leader in every Congress every year for one hour talk about being in power, you know, and what it meant. And so I, I got, my mind was nurtured at a mm. very early age to look at things from um, certain kinds of perspective. And then they always had, there's a program they used to go call Young Outstanding Persons Award. And it was always the 10 most outstanding people from around the world in different categories. I used to love to just sit in that ceremony every year and watch all these people. Everybody had to be under 40 to get their award. Mm. But to see the amazing things that each person did in their different, different categories, you know, whether it was science, it was economics, whether it was social work, whether it was different things, you know, and I would sit there and keep saying to myself, I can do these things. If these people can do it, I can do it too. And so it sort of shaped my focus and, and my mindset. And obviously, as I left university and finished youth call, um, whilst I was waiting for what would, uh, would be my perfect job, I um, took a job in a furniture company just to kill time. Mm. But that led me into entrepreneurship. I, I didn't think about it at all. <laughs> I didn't think about setting up a business. It was an accident of, of faith. And I only lasted three and a half months in that company. And I went to start my own company, largely to correct what I thought they were doing wrong or the way they did things. And so it was just my desire to, uh, to build a company with the right values and all of that that led me to start a company in my 20s. Interestingly, January this year, Chess Center Group became 35 years. Wow. So it's been 35 years of, uh, well, because I started early. So it was easier to have clocked so much time uh, at an early stage of one's life. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think I sort of just moved from one thing to the other, always finding a medium to express myself mm -hmm. in everything I got involved in, whether it was church mm -hmm. or, or it was uh, in organizations or national issues. I've always been passionate. I think JC's nurtured me for nation building mm -hmm. and, and sort of, you know, challenged my mind about, you know, the way to look at things and all of that. So it's really like a building block. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of just built one and the other. And, but the one thing that was always important for me was clarity of what my values were, mm -hmm. what my goals, what my goals were and making the choices to stay true to myself and sometimes not the easiest of choices, having to make some hard calls in order to remain focused on the things that I considered uh, important. And uh, I seem to, one thing I seem to also learn is to, I'm quite decisive, let's put it that way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I tend to look at things from a long view and I immediately at some point take a decision. I remember when I started the furniture company. At that point, there were quite a few of us young people that were starting about that time. And, you know, everybody was in home and office furniture because it made sense. If one isn't selling, the other one will sell. So. It, it, it seemed like the best strategy to produce both home and office. But after the first two years, I decided I was not interested in producing home furniture. And that made us the first company to focus on office furniture. Okay. And, and it was simply from a very practical view. I, I wanted to be able to produce things in volumes. Hmm. And I looked at the way 
home furniture is structured. In your living room, just think about it. You have a three-seater sofa, you have a two-seater sofa, you have singles, your coffee tables are different from your center table, your dining chairs, are this, a few are the same, the head chairs are different, you've got a console, a this. The variety of what you need to produce for a home collection is distracting for my vision of doing volumes. Mm. But if I go into one office, the MD is one, the general managers might be, let's take a bank, maybe a few general managers, five, six, and all of that. Maybe all the top executive people are about 20, but mm. there'd be like a few thousand general staff. Mm. And therefore I could get an order for a thousand pieces of one type of table. Mm. It's far more efficient for me to set my production and my machinery to produce a thousand pieces. You might make a lot more money from selling the bigger ones, but when you take the numbers, I would make a lot more money overall from selling the cheaper, larger volume ones. And it was also more efficient for me in terms of production and all of So I made a hard call. And everybody thought, well, why? You know, you, if you don't sell this, that is not wise. But I've also learned how to make my decision and fight for it. Mm -hmm. And I always move from conviction. So we, we sort of need to train ourselves as leaders to know what exactly do you believe in? What exactly are you trying to achieve? And how do the decisions you make every day support that vision? And sometimes you're the only one that can see what you see because others will come from their perspective but if they can't see your total picture, they can never give you the right uh, instruction about what to do, which is why I said earlier that counsel is good, but counsel is information. Mm. Decision is yours. Because the only person that can match the information you have, information you receive with the vision that you have in order to make what is the right decision for you, because it can be a different decision for somebody else. But only you can take all the information you've been given, match it with the spoken and unspoken part of your vision, because mm. every part of your vision is never spoken. Mm. There are thoughts and dreams and imagination you haven't even put words to, but mm. in your heart, you have a gut feeling about where you want to go and what you want to do, you know why you will not do some things. And there's a point at which you're going to say, I'm sorry, but I can't do this. Or I'm sorry, this is what I must do. Other people are going to say, oh, no, no, no. But you know, you, and sometimes you might be wrong, but so what? Mm. You know, if you're afraid to make some mistakes in making your decisions, you wouldn't have a chance to innovate. Absolutely. Because the process of innovation half the time is accidental. Absolutely. You know, and, and I'm a trained scientist. My first degree is in chemistry. Yeah. You never go into the lab with an answer. You go with questions. So I approach everything from the mind of a scientist. It's mm. always, this is my hypothesis, which is a theory. It's an unconfirmed issue. I walk into the lab and I want to try various things to prove my hypothesis to be true or not. So when you walk in with an open mind, you get a chance to experiment. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you can reach conclusions that support your original hypothesis or that prove to you that that is wrong, but this is what is right based on your discoveries. And you might discover something totally different and all of that. So it, it's, I'm still a scientist at heart. And mm -hmm. I think from that mindset, but everything else is uh, driven towards whatever it is that I perceive is my call, my assignment, or my goal for that period. And I've learned how to jump off the cliff to, mm. in order to find what's in the valley. Because half the time, what we want is not always at, um, it's not a touch away. Mm. We have to have the courage to take some risks mm. in order to discover it. I can see an entrepreneur talking <laughs> because all the things you've described, 
you know, are so, so key to being a very good leader and an entrepreneur. I like the fact that you, you right from when you were in school, you have always pursued you know, things like leadership, like being in JC, JC, JCs. I remember JCs, yes. I never enjoyed them. Yes. <laughs> but I remember JCs and um, you, you know, being there, learning that even like about nation building at that point in time. And I remember Tony Bakari also mentioned this yesterday. She said she started learning about entrepreneurship in her case when she was in school. And I just want to say to everyone here, let us remember that leadership, entrepreneurship, nation building, we can begin to inculcate in our children right from now. We don't wait for the school, the church, friends. We can begin to develop that mindset in our staff, in our own children. I can see determination. You know, you talked about the entrepreneurship opportunities. That was because you worked somewhere and you saw some things that you didn't like and you're able to identify those skill gaps or those gaps and you decided to go for it. And did you only mention values, values, values? Yes. Oh, yes, she mentioned five key things that we must remember, even as we continue the leadership um, journey and also in um, building a, a succession plan. She mentioned yeah. five things that I'd like to quickly talk about. She talked about clearly articulating our values to staff. What yeah. are the values that we hold as core? that all our members of staff must understand. Tony also mentioned it yesterday, Bakari. She talked about having clear governance structures. That's all, that's, you know, we're going to talk about that. You know, she talked about um, solid systems and structures, recruitment, retention, and then humility. That's what she mentioned yesterday. I just want to remind us. So I can see in that being decisive, it's also part of um, the, the traits of being a good leader and a good entrepreneur. You talked about the hypothesis, really, when we start any business. <laughs> it's all an idea. It's a hypothesis. We don't know if it's going to work or not. We're just uh, testing it out. We're just it's testing a lot of assumptions, yes. Uh, it, they're just assumptions. So we continue to, as we go ahead, we're tweaking. Sometimes we have to just, you know, discard and then go again. So that is how we should approach um, our you know, entrepreneurship endeavors, our businesses and things like that. Thank you so much for that. So you have mentioned a lot and we can see all you have learned over the years, all your experiences right from when you were in school. My next question will be, all these things you have in you, how are you passing it on? Ndidi Unelli said something. She said, when she talked about humility, she said, we must know when it is time to let others shine. She says, we must know when it's time, when talking about succession planning, where you actually pass the baton to other people. We have so much in us. Most of us have been doing this, I'm sure 30 something years, 40 something years, I've been in leadership for 35 years and so many other people here on this platform. And the question is, who is leading next? You are, you are involved in so many things. Who are you, how are you depositing these things into people you have groomed? How, okay. please tell us about that. So, so in my case, I've been intentional. Beautiful, intentionality. About, about um, yes, you, you need intentionality to achieve it. That's one. Two, it's at an early stage in our organization, one of the things I know is that you can't teach people just by words. Mm. You teach them the best way by example. Mm. Because, you know, do as I do is more powerful than do as I say. And we tend to think that, oh, we just have to, no, don't do that. No. If you say don't do it and they see you do it, you've taught nothing. Mm. Because mm. then you lose integrity with your people. Especially when I did set out to build a very value-based business. That's mm. a difficult thing to teach because everybody's coming from different backgrounds and they have different values. Mm. And so the easiest way 
was always to have to live up to it. Lovely. When I wanted to teach my people, I remember when we opened our showroom on in July, me, the way to teach my people how to deal with customers and engage with them was I had to be on the showroom floor myself. And I used to say, just follow me. Awesome. And then so I'll have, you know, at least two people working with me when I'm working with a customer. It'd be another set when I'm working another time. But it's to say, what am I doing with this customer? How, what knowledge am I trying to share? What is my goal? What am I trying to impart on the customer? And then when I say we operate by certain values and a customer comes and they see this big opportunity, but if the opportunity comes with a request to inflate the invoice mm. for the customer, and I'm like, but you know, we can't do that. Mm. You know, they're waiting to see, they think it's easy when it's small transactions. <laughs> when you have the big transactions and it comes and their customer tells them that's what they need to do. And they come and ask you, what are we going to do? And you're like, but you already know the answer. They said, I thought, well, you know, for this volume. And then you say, no, we can't. We can't just means we cannot. And that, I, I remember one particular incident you know, we're the ones who introduced the security doors at the entrance of banks into Nigeria. Mm. And I was on holidays in Houston, I will never forget. And my head of that division had just been asked to one of the banks for a meeting. And they asked her that, look, we need to buy 200 units of this. This particular bank was going to start buying for the first time. They already had over 200 branches. So they wanted 200 units. These are items that cost over 2 million each. Hmm. And they said to her, but on each one, we need you to uh, add 250,000 to it. That will go to us. And she said to them, we don't do that. So I don't think we can do it. And they're like, no, what do you mean? Go out and tell your madam, she's a businesswoman. She will understand. So she said, okay. And then she called me in Houston. And when she did, I said to her, but why are you calling me? You already know the answer. So why didn't you just stand your ground and say, oh, I'm sorry. We cannot do this. We don't do this in our company. She said, because she said I should go and ask, I said, no, next time, don't. Just insist that you're sure this is the answer you will get. So obviously she went back to them to say, I'm sorry, but the answer is still the same. It's not something we do and we won't do it. And I remember that day I learned a lesson because my first utterance was, oh, if that's what they need, then they can keep their job. We're not going to do it. And then I remember something Pastor Bimbo Odukoya always said to me, because there was a day she said to me, you know, stop saying, if they can't do it our way, they can keep their job. He said, no, say, we're not going to do what they want, but they, the job is, we're still going to take the job. That that mm. becomes your prayer. Mm. So she mm. sort of, tweaked my thinking because you know it was it was a matter of oh if we have to do what they want then they can take the job away she said no mm. you know and then she quoted scriptures for me that gave me perspective on it mm. so as soon as I finished talking to my staff and when she went away I said to myself why did I even say they can keep the job so I got up and I started praying and I said you know what Lord we're not going to do what they want and we're going to take this job. And I started making declarations. I stood my ground, stood against everything. And the, uh, nobody is going to, do, on account of unrighteousness, shall no man take our land. I started making my own declarations and stood and fought. The next morning, because of time difference, mm -hmm. the next morning, the lady called me back and said to me that you wouldn't believe it, that they called her back and said to her, you know, you guys are very arrogant simply because everybody knows you're the best in, in the industry. That anyway, 
you know, we can't buy this from anybody else. We have to buy it from you. That's so we can be sure we have the right system. Go and bring your invoice. We'll have to buy it at your price the way you want to sell it. And we got that. So it's one thing to say what you say, because, you know, we can write a corporate vision, all our values, we can write it down and post it around. Mm -hmm. But if we don't leave it mm -hmm. for our people, we're not going to achieve anything. Mm -hmm. Because what I've found in my experience most powerful for impacting, for teaching the people who work with us and the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. to be able to mm -hmm. lead the organizations in the way we dream and desire of, especially for founders, mm. is really that you must leave what you say. People mm. must be able, you know, you referred to the uh, first bank situation when it happened. Listen, what saved me at the end of the day that made it easy to move forward was simply because I'd lived my life and encountered, I don't know how many thousands of people in my journey. And they all had a real experience of who I am, how I live, what I believe, and what I do. So mm -hmm. you can't just get up and for your own benefit, try to say something when the person mm -hmm. saying it knows is false, but yeah. for an agenda and a goal, you just go out and make a declaration because you think there's no way to respond to it. You know, I remember someone calling me in between and saying to me, you know, there's an old army fighting for you online. And I said, army, where did I find them? <laughs> it was army of people I didn't even know because I didn't bother to go into that space at all. Mm -hmm. But they were fighting from their knowledge, their encounter, and their experience. Mm -hmm. And what I've done with my time in terms of whether teaching my own team or building the next generation of leaders for a country and for the world as it is, is to spend a lot of tangible time sharing my thoughts, sharing my experiences, and trying to influence the way people think. The other thing about leadership, if you want to achieve effective leadership and raise the next generation of people, don't give people responsibilities without giving them power. Absolutely. Because we tend to give people assignments, mm. give people responsibilities, but we hold back the power. Mm. And therefore, they can't do anything without us. Mm. We've achieved nothing. Mm. Because we don't train people to make decisions that way, including our children. A lot of us as parents don't teach our children how to make decisions. We make every single decision for them. We just tell them to go and live based on our decisions. We're not going to be here for all times and we will not be everywhere they are at every point in time. What we need to invest time in is teach them the process to think mm. so that they can arrive at the right decision when we're not there and they're confronted with a situation. It's really important for the people who work for us and for the people that we have authority over. And give people responsibilities, but give them power. Now, will they make mistakes sometimes? Yes, they will. We didn't know everything on day one. They will make mistakes, but so what? They will learn from, if they make the same mistake tw twice, then they're foolish. Mm. But Every time they make a mistake trying to do the right thing, that's value. That's mm. not a loss. Mm. That's something they've learned that they would use to serve you as well. And you can, what, one thing I try to do is like, let's make it basic. So I have a new house help in the house and you don't know where she's coming from. And then you say to her, can you get me a cutlery? Well, you probably have to be specific and say, get me a fork because cutlery will be a bit above her pay grade. And then you say, get me a fork. And she'll say, yes, ma. She heard you. And then she goes into the kitchen. 
and she brings you a fork like this. And then you shout and scream at her. What has she done wrong? Trust yeah. me, nothing. Because in reality, you asked for a fork. Mm -hmm. And what she did was to go and get a fork for you. Now, how do you ensure she does what you want? Maybe what you're expecting is your cutlery will be on a saucer, in a tray, and all of that, so that the hygiene of it is preserved. That's right. But if nobody has taught her, you can't hold her accountable for what she doesn't know. So when she makes that first mistake and you say to her, gift, the next time I ask you for a fork, I expect you to do this and this and this. And she says, oh, thank you, ma. What have you done? You've taught her. And now how do you benefit from that moment of teaching? The next time you ask, you might have visitors. She's not going to embarrass you because she's going to do the right thing. That's only because you've taken the time to teach her. And it, it, it's a way of life. We have to, you know, your driver makes a mistake. How do you respond? Mm. You know, to say, calm down. When you're doing this, do not take every teachable moment. And that's something I have learned and I've imbibed. And it's also why I developed all this. I have various programs like my life series, which is for younger people. I run live series sessions in Nigeria, maybe three times a year. I usually take in about 200 to 225 young women in a room. And I spend about six, seven hours mm. with them. I will talk about life, mm. you know? I lay some principles and then we spend a lot of time answering questions. Just because, you know, we, we, we keep saying these young people, they don't know anything, they're this. But you know what I realized? We have not invested in teaching them many things. We're holding them accountable for the investments we have not made. It's, all, it's almost like parents, a girl graduates from university and the next thing you are looking for is for her to bring a husband. You haven't even told her how to determine who is the right person for her to marry. We haven't had that conversation. We have not invested time to talk about life and how, you know, your spouse is a key success factor. What are the things she must consider? We're all caught up in a day where she's going to wear a lovely, beautiful white dress and there's a lot of ceremony going on left, right and center. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've discovered. And, and I spent a lot of that time. I run a program called the 360 Executive. Based on my experience serving in all the, on all the boards and in the spaces where I serve, I've realized the gaps that exist for women who want to get to the highest level of their career. So I started a program. I never take more than 15 in a class. I spend nine hours, one day, under the 360 executive program to talk about those things. Most of the women in that class are technically competent, mm. but there is knowledge that is beyond your technical competence Absolutely. that you need to know in order to be successful at the highest level as a woman with ambition that wants to get to the top of her game. And that's what we do in those hours. And then I help each class to become a tribe because mm -hmm. in my understanding, you can't walk the journey at the highest level all by yourself. Mm -hmm. You need a, a support system of people who share your same vision, who have the same dreams, who understand what is on the what it takes to serve in those places and mm -hmm. it's a different structure from oh my friends from secondary school my friends from primary school nobody is saying those are not your friends but you know what if they're not working the same type of journey the areas where they cannot support you because they don't even understand what the issues are so it, it's the intentionality of finding the right kind of support system to nurture your leadership and mm -hmm. to stand with you as you walk through it, that becomes key in our journey. Amazing. <laughs> I, I don't want you to stop, but it's just, it's just so great. And I can see um, how you're very, very focused on developing people, developing them, your own leaders at work and other people, as you said, for the nation, 
even just people who just want to learn about leadership that intentionality is key you teaching them values making them understand talking also about your leaders at work making them understand why chair center or whatever other businesses you run why they do what they do i love the example of the of the business that you got when you were in houston and from what you're saying and another key thing you've also said is that empowering people and developing, giving them autonomy. I think it's one area where we are lacking. And it's one area that I, I believe so much in. There is no way you can expand. There is no way you can be everything you've been called and created to be when you are micromanaging. People will give, they will empower you, train you, but they will not give you the ability oh, to make decisions. Yeah. And yeah. it's just it's just so counterproductive. So talking about that, you know, I think it's so so key. The way you painstakingly, deliberately, intentionally develop other leaders, developing other leaders, I think is so so key. All right, I'm just one or two more questions. So talking about succession, um, even in your company. So you've mentioned focused a lot on developing the people. I'm sure, you know, by, by laying the example, they see you, you model it to them. Are there other things you do maybe to, to develop them? Are there programs, are there training, coaching? You know, are there other things you do? To I think you must always, you must always invest in your people. I mean, send them. I think all my key managers mm -hmm. at the stage, every one of them had gone to Lagos Business School Amazing. for their managers program or senior managers program, different kind of programs uh, like that, so that they can find their own voices, mm. learn the principles. I had done the chief executive program at Lagos Business School, and thereafter, I started sending my own people in, in, in pairs to other programs there. Because, you know, if it doesn't matter how great you are. If your lieutenants are not strong, you're weak. You're no. only as strong as your weakest. <laughs> yes. So it's not, um, I, I, and you know, in my case, I, I also took um, a hard decision because one of the things I'd done by, I think by 31, when I had my second son, I made a decision that I was going to exit being at the center of driving my business by 50. Mm. It was mm. a decision I made. Exit and plan. Yes. I mm. decided that was going to be mm. my, my plan. And once I, I made up my mind about that, I sort of started being deliberate about team members. I remember at a point, I felt that a lot of my, the members of my team were relaxed. Mm. Why were they relaxed? We had a good brand. Mm. We had a good business. We had a large customer base of repeat customers. So mm. the sales team were not hungry for sales. They were managers of sales mm. because sales used to come to us rather than us chasing after sales. Because at that point, we were top of our game. We were confident of our product. The market also recognized that. And we had a lot of long-term customers. So they were benefiting from the work that had been done over years. So I felt that, look, it wasn't the best place for us to be for the long term. Mm. That I had to find how to stoke the fire of my team mm. to become hungry for sales so that they would drive and open new doors and new opportunities and not just sit on managing the opportunity mm. of their sales. And I remember that what I did then was first I went to, okay, I had a friend who was the CEO of FedEx at that point. It's a friend of mine, we went to uh, IFE together as well. And their guys, their people are very dynamic, very driven, very sales hungry, very sales driven. Mm. So I called him. And said, look, I, when I think about the way your people go after business, it fires me up. 
And I'm trying to find out to introduce that DNA into my own people. Mm. So he told me that, look, there's a guy that used to work for them that he had, um, had exited and set up a training program that trains their people. And that the guy understood exactly what was required. He said, okay. So first thing I did, I brought that guy to start a training program over time with my sales team. First, to make an assessment of every member of my sales team. Absolutely. And then um, decide what the gap was and then implement a program. So in making that assessment, you could assess those that, you know what, they're spent. Mm. There's nothing more you could add to them. It was time <laughs> for them to exit because they were not going to be able to move forward in terms of uh, what was required for the next phase of the company. So we took those hard decisions. And then he said, also, let's bring in some fresh blood. Mm. So we brought in, I think five or six or seven young people, young professionals who hadn't worked. They, had, they were graduates, they were looking for opportunities, but they were interested in sales. Luckily, I had the after school uh, graduate development center that I had set up. And we used to train young graduates to be employable. So he did a, um, an assessment and chose a number of people from there and put them with our current salespeople in a program to train them. And I then went after one person with that kind of DNA and brought him in as a chief marketing officer. And that totally changed the game. Mm. So we also must know when to rejig mm. our structure, rejig our human capital, and to diffuse the system mm. when people have become relaxed mm. and are no longer able to move mm. as you need. So just bringing in those new people changed the other people as well. Mm -hmm. And they were all fired up in order to create that change. And when I decided that at 50, I would leave. At 48, I hired a consulting firm and they evaluated the entire group, developed the group structure, created the offices for the group, shopped within all our people for people into those positions. And the positions that we had no one to fit, they then sought to fit from outside mm. as a way to build that group structure at that point for us to then build up. Luckily for me, shortly after that was when I got really distracted and busy with mm. some of my board assignments. And, but I had already made those arrangements without knowing I was going to you know, uh, be caught up in some uh, positions and all of that, that would consume so much of my time. And you know what I haven't done is I have not allowed the temptation to go back in to be <laughs> at the center of it, no. So I'm not, I, I haven't run the chair center at the, as the head of it really for the last 12 years. Amazing, amazing. Amazing. Honestly, this is just, it's just so, because I like the fact that you've been very intentional and deliberate. You had an exit plan. And even before that time came, you had, you, you put all the structures in place to ensure that the company would keep running, even when you weren't there. You mentioned, you know, the building, when you now had the group structure, yeah, Missy Edu also mentioned it. She said, sometimes you build the internal talents. Sometimes you buy <laughs> the internal talent. Sometimes yes. you borrow the internal talent. You, know, you, you borrow from outside. Sometimes you buy yeah. from the internal. But it starts with looking at the people you have within. And, yeah. and I want to reiterate that this is not only for companies. This goes for, you know, corporate as in not just the profit, let me say business organizations, for NGOs, churches, any area, for, for single business owners, these things are so key. The, uh, the idea that you need to plan for the future 
of your organization. Now we're just going to, before I take the very last question, we want to do a quick poll, poll time, everyone. Poll time, I want to see if we've been learning anything at all. <laughs> poll time. Abayami, can you please put up the poll? Yes, so let's see some questions quickly. Now I want to ask, do you have a well-articulated succession management system in operation in your organization? We have heard Mrs. Awoshika. Now, would you say you have a well-articulated succession management system? Your succession plan is in place. You have a structure. You know how to start, how to manage your talent. How many people would say, yes, they do. Oh, thank you. And it is from all the things we have been talking about since Saturday, it is very obvious. And I'm glad, I'm glad that we are very self-reflective people and we understand that this is key and we need to go back and look at developing a leadership pipeline in our organizations and having a, an effective, enduring succession plan. The next question is, what is the biggest challenge you face in being able to build this leadership pipeline in your organization? What is it? Is it uncommitted staff? People who jack bar are the first <laughs> sign of problems. <laughs> Uncommitted staff who lack motivation, so you're not even you don't even know what to do with them. Is it that you have you know there's a lack of structured career path, so you do have the talents, but you really don't know how to approach it. Limited understanding of how to go about it. Is it a failure of funds because it takes funds when you're developing your talent uh, pipeline? You need to have the funds for the training and other things that you need to do. Or you just don't know how to recognize talent. I can see a lot of it has to do with limited understanding. And I appreciate you all for being here today because you understand you need to know more about it and you have signed up for this summit. Amazing. The very last, in developing a leadership pipeline, what should be your greatest focus? Is that the training and the mentorship, which we've spoken about a lot? Is it, develop, is it that long-term goal and objectives of your organization, putting it in front of you, even as you develop your succession plan? Is it trying to attract, develop, retain the best talents that can help you grow into the future? Because you have your plans for the future and you need staff that can actually get you there. And the answer is all of the other, what a smart class. <laughs> very, 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 very smart. All the answers as, you know, as, um, is, as I thought they would be. So well done, well done, well done. Thank you. So we're going to begin to round up. We've talked a lot about developing people, internal talents, bringing in, external people to diffuse and just to mix up, you know, the, 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 the organization, the, the employees, and to get people, you know, fired up, new blood, new ideas. And that's what you have been doing at the chair center. You had an exit plan. Do we have an exit plan? <laughs> and you've prepared your organization for the future. You know, I keep asking, why do we focus so much on now? I'm not, is this just a rhetor rhetorical question? Why do we focus so much on now? Having built such huge, fantastic, successful companies, organizations, institutions, it could be, you know, like I said, it could be a church, it could be anything, but we are not as focused on the future of that thing we have built. How? I, I don't get it. Which is the problem we have in Nigeria and Africa. You go abroad, you see, Tony was talking about a, a, um, a company in Italy that had been on since 16 something, 300 and something years. In the US here, you see a lot of schools, universities, you know, high schools, 100 years, 144 years. How come it's not, we're not being proactive about this it beats me but i've been there once but you know is that is that passion for me that i've been there and i don't want us to make that mistake so 
as we begin to round up, my darling sis, I'm sure um, people would like to know, usually in a meeting like this, we look at our strengths and what we have done and things like that. And I've given the example uh, of someone, my son actually, who says that failure is a bruise. It's not a tattoo. <laughs> it's not permanent. <laughs> so <laughs> if somebody is interested in, you know, it could be a life thing you face. Not, might not just be directly in terms of developing um, potential leaders and success successors. Can you share briefly, you know, um, a failure or a moment that you, you went through some hard times, hard knocks, and how you were able to overcome it? So we can also know that she's human and she she's worked in her shoes. <laughs> Well, I think anybody that tells you they haven't had uh, any challenging moments in their life, they lie. Mm. And you would I know, I, I, I would even want to employ you if you haven't lived through, I wouldn't employ you at a very senior level if mm. you haven't had to manage a crisis or mm. go through a situation. Because you, you might have to experience it for the first time on my watch. And mm. that means, you know, we will be the guinea pig. Mm. Now, but, I, but there's also um, a place for thinking about what is your mindset mm. about challenges. Because I, I, I always make this point because I realize that there is a chance for the hard times to knock the fire out of you mm. and you never get up mm. and fight and leave again. Absolutely. And most people, because they consider what others think about those moments and they name it failure, mm. they then give up and they don't. So in my vocabulary, I don't have the word failure. And mm. Alex, the reason I don't is because with the same mindset of a scientist, I consider every part of my journey as a learning curve. Mm. And that that learning curve has the smooth moments. Mm. It has the fun moments, but it also has the challenging moments. And that the challenging moments of my journey teach me the things I couldn't learn anywhere else. Mm. But if I look at that situation with the mindset of learning, I will survive it better. Mm. Because I would look at it and say, what am I learning here? What is in this for me that helps me? I'll, I'll give you an example. In 2003, no, 2004, January, the federal government made an announcement on network news as is usual, that they were banning all sorts of things and it included furniture. Now, the way they did it did not even separate components, production materials from the final product. In essence, it was literally like our business was being shut down. Yeah. And everybody else was worried on my behalf. I remember I was in business school then. I was in school in Spain and I'd come home. So I was home, but I had schoolwork and I was working. And it was Tara Adirioko of Blessed Memory. He called me to say, did you listen to the network news? I said, no, brother, I have school work. He said, no, the government just shut down your business. I'm like, eh. Hey. So I said to him, it is well. He said, what do you mean by it is well? I told you they just shut down. I said, don't worry, brother, it is well. So I went to my husband, told him, and then we went to wait for the news recap. Mm. And when they announced the, when they went through the news recap, we, we, we heard exactly what had happened. Now, I had two options. Mm. To wake up the next day and decide that though I started my business with a sense of values and values were important to me, that I would become a smuggler. Mm. And that would kill everything that I said that I was, including my faith as a Christian, because I have to do the things that didn't align with it. Or 
that I was going to get up and work out how do I continue in my business without doing the wrong things. Now, for me, I decided at that moment, I, I had clarity that I was where the Lord had called me to. So there was no confusion as to the fact that I was in the business line that I'd been called to. I also then went into my faith to remind myself that God is not the God that puts my feet upon the rock and kicks the rock from under my feet. Mm. That mm. the Lord permitted the situation then, as the Bible says, everything works together for my good. So there had to be a good in it for me. And how? So obviously it became a prayer point that Lord just guide me and lead me as to how to go. Now, out of that crisis, following the clear decisions, one, becoming a smuggler was not an option. I couldn't take from God when he was good and then deny him mm. in challenging times. I had to remain who I had said I was. And to do that, I had to find how to remain in my business without breaching the law. Mm. And the Lord led me every step of the way. That led to my Sokoa factory because against all odds, I went to Sokoa who had been producing for us to say, the government of my country just changed laws. You can't produce for me. You have to produce with me in Nigeria and not produce for me in France. And they come to me in Nigeria. They laughed, mm. but I knew who I knew and who I knew was the Lord. And I knew he would make a way where there seemed to be none. Eventually, a few months after, they came around and said, okay, what do you need? We will do this with you. That's how we got started on that. And they invested 21% in that. Guarantee Trust Bank at that point decided to invest 32. We've bought them out since, and they've been out of it. But at that point, they invested 32% into the business. Two individuals bought five percentage. I put the rest of the investment and that factory was set up. We then went on and set up a new laminate processing factory, which is Ikeja factory. All of this came out of that crisis. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was, we were not the only ones that were hit. Anybody in our industry was hit with the situation. But we moved 10 and a half months after, we opened the chair factory in Nigeria in joint venture with the largest French manufacturer of office seating. And then it became supplier to our competitors because it was not an easy move to make readily, but we could do it legally and following the right path. Because in the moment of crisis, certain things were clear. I was not going to become somebody else mm. and I was not going to betray my faith or abandon my values. And that helped me to chart the path to move forward stage by stage until we completely got out of that. So it's really about how do you look at your challenging situations? When we had the, the first bank situation, there are options. It was to go to war and make a lot of noise as they were misusing the media to tell false tales and all of that make a lot of noise with them. But you know one thing you must learn in life, you mm. must know when to lose a battle in order to win the war. Mm. Mm. They're two different things. Mm. Losing the battle is a temporary situation. Winning the war is your long-term gain. Absolutely. But you must understand who you are and you must know where you're going. You must also be able to look at the context of the scenario. At that point, there wasn't a system to fight back. Mm. Why? First, you were fighting a national institution, albeit mm. the person at the helm of it was a completely compromised person following his own agenda. But he had the presidency totally in his pocket. He had control of a lot of institutions that made it easy for him to do the things he was mm. doing. If you went on a shouting war, the facts will get lost Absolutely. in the noise. Mm. It doesn't make sense. So we have to learn first to be strategic and to play the long game. 
Mm. And it took a lot of grace mm. and God mm. and the legacy of one's life, which is why it's important for each one of us to pay attention to the trail of our journey. Mm. Because mm. in our trail, in what we do every day, we're writing a story. Mm. And when we get to the crossroads, those stories will speak for us or they will speak against us. Mm. To the glory of God, my journey spoke for me. Mm. And, and uh, thereafter, you know, it was clear on many fronts. And I've gone on to do multiple great things internationally, locally, serving on global boards, serving on global platforms. And look, because the facts at the end of the day will speak for themselves. And he didn't take, you know how Yoruba people say, a lie can travel for 20 years. Mm. In the 21st year, the truth oh, will overtake. Cool. Well, we didn't have to wait for 20 years, as we can all see. Barely two years after, mm. all the facts are coming out. The things that if we said them then, if we tried to explain what the battles, the real battles were about, the things we were not willing to do because mm. of who we were, and the things they wanted to do and what they were protecting, it would have been difficult because people have not seen all of it. Mm. And we are very, unfortunately for us, because of the failure of leadership over time, mm. our people don't trust people anymore. And understandably, they've been beaten and battered by people that could not be trusted. So anybody in position or power in this country, people tend at the first sign to distrust them. And so these guys have learned how to trade on that. It's yeah. something that as a country we must pay attention to because we have allowed people to weaponize information. The first person to shout is believed. Is believed. <laughs> you don't even bother to investigate at the possibility of it. Every person who understood institutions and structure and governance mm. would immediately know those things were impossible. Mm. Absolutely mm. impossible. But they played it, unfortunately, time has revealed what the facts are and the rest of it will still be revealed. It's a matter of time. So, oh. you know, don't, for me, it's, you can't be afraid of the challenging moments because they're part of our journey. Mm. But you mm. must always know that when you get into them, you're bigger than the situation. Mm. Your mindset must remind you that you can get out of any of it, but walk your truth. Let your values speak for you. Remember to live right now, because when you get into those situations, your antecedents will be shouting and they better be shouting the right things. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you. Don't be afraid of the challenges. You, you have said it over and over. And when I started at the beginning as well, you mentioned the being true to yourself. Yeah. Be true to yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's just been amazing. We're going to just take two or three questions for those who can still wait for that. But before then, I just want to, you know, talk about this mastermind that I have organized because I've been hearing a lot of this, what did you do? How did you do it? And I have people like Mrs. Awoshika and other people that we brought to talk about, you know, how we have done it. But then this mastermind is the next thing to do. Now we have heard all these things at the summit. We've learned how, you know, some of the things that have been done by these leaders, people have said, okay, tell us step by step, what exactly, how does it work? How do you go from talent management? How do you, first of all, attract, retain your top staff? How do you develop them? How do you craft a succession um, plan? And that is what the mastermind is about. I'll be sending out information about that. But also, I believe that we're going to put up um, a link where people can register for calls to find out about this mastermind. It's something that we have done. It's something that we can actually pass on even to as many as want to learn about it. And then we're not guessing, how do we go 
about it. It's honestly um, popular demand. And I know that you will take advantage of building this leadership pipeline and crafting your own succession plan. We talked a lot about other things, job rotation, mentorship, coaching, you know, all the things we talked about, cross-functional um, assignments, in-house development. There's so many steps to developing this leadership pipeline. So see you at the mastermind. We will take one or two questions as I think that we have just a few. We can only take a few. Have we been blessed? Can we just put those flowers and the claps in the chat box right now? Please put the chat, the, the, the flowers there for Mrs. Our amazing, amazing guest, Mrs. Awoshika. So um, I will just take two or three questions. Uh, we will be taking two or three questions. Mrs. Awoshika, I hope you don't mind. Just a few more. We started a bit late, so we are, st we are stopping just a little bit. It's late. We, we it's, took like five minutes. So so now the first question is anonymous. How do you handle a case where you give someone responsibilities and the power to make decisions, but the person consistently finds a reason not to act and always blames someone else or someone else uh, or someone else for why things did not progress? <laughs> How do you support this person with stepping up i want to believe that this person is you know whoever this is is you're concerned because they're part of the key players you know that's why i want to believe that that's why you're asking this question so how do you give people responsibilities um to make decisions the power autonomy to make decisions but they're always blaming the next person what do you do with that kind of person would you like to answer that first or should i read yeah. Why not? You know, one of the biggest responsibility that you have with um, uh, selecting your leadership pipeline is mm. in identifying the right people. Absolutely. It's not just about having people. <laughs> it's about having the right people. And that's a responsibility that's on you. Absolutely. Because you must, you know, the first thing we must do is define the role that you want to put someone in. Mm. Define the role, define what is required with nobody in mind. Mm. Just deal with the role alone. Mm. I need someone to be general manager here. Okay, what will be the responsibility of that general manager? List it out, be clear about it. Now. When you've listed the role with nobody in mind, what kind of person will be able to fulfill all these roles that is required of this general manager? And that kind of person is not just BSc this, PhD this, <laughs> masters in this. It includes the nature, the personality. Do you need someone? Mm search room because they don't know how to manage people. They don't know how to encourage others. They don't know how to. So you must define what is required, including the personality, the style, the nature, everything that is required. When you have done that, it's the only time that you begin to consider who. Mm. Because then you're less likely to make a mistake. What we tend to do is use who we have rather than who fits the role. Mm -hmm. So if the, what your question, the person you've defined in your question, you're obviously putting people to their, you're playing to their weakness rather than to their strength. Yes. Uh, uh, it means yeah. that person does not have the capacity to do what you want the person to do, which is why, and because the person feels she has to impress you, is why she would always find somebody else to blame, to blame. for her <laughs> failure. So it, it's not, there's no way you can deal with that except that you have not gone Definitely. through the right process and you have not chosen the right person. That's it. I, I, and that requires that you make the hard call yeah. of making a change. Now it's possible to, people seem right and you put them there and they don't pan out to be right. You don't leave them there to fail long. 
or for the organization to be destroyed. You must also learn how to make a, uh, a hard decision when you need to, and then find where they are a perfect fit for, where they will succeed. Because sometimes we promote people into their incompetence rather than promote them to a place of competence. Thank you so much. So, Mami Zawoshika, very well said. We, we don't only consider the present performance of the people we're training. And in this case, we can't even see the performance. We are also looking at the present and the potential for the future. Yeah. So if this yeah. person is not even showing <laughs> any, 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 you know, like real strength, even in the present, I really don't think um, such a person is uh, someone you should be considering um, as part of your leadership pipeline. No, no, if that person might be, might not be the right person to consider for that, for that role. particular role. Because sometimes role. they're good, but you have put them in the wrong place. Yes. So we must also consider that possibility. It's well, about I, profiling people in order I, to put them in the right place for them. And I feel it's also about the training because why I first of all said I was this person blaming other people. It's mm. not a leadership trait. It's definitely a problem. A yeah, it, it's so. a weakness. It's a weakness. Yeah. So that shows that that person still needs to go through a lot of training, whatever role you decide to put that person in. You know, it's that a bit that that tendency to blame other people for their uh, fault and not take responsibility. But not take responsibility. That's a weakness in whatever role. It's a character trait, actually. It, it, is. So that's, it is. So that's a challenge. That's a challenge, and we know we talk about attitude now, not just yeah. your technical. You have the attitude, which is why I said that. Okay, so another, uh, and we said also, you know, succession plan is an ongoing process. So you continue yeah. to. Other people you have, where do I move them to? Do yeah. they have the skills or the ability in this? Area? What do I need to do to develop them? Okay, so we're just going to take two more. We have to go. At what okay. stage of the business do you start planning for succession? Can a company that say that say five years old start having a succession plan? Is it too early oh. or not? Would it be at a later time? Ah, I would let, like let me tell, let me tell you a story to answer that question. So oh. I chaired the board of a school. Imperial mm. Gate School, actually, in, mm. in, in Lekki. And I know a lot of you are probably APEN members and all of that. And the school was founded by uh, Balanle Olubumi. And, uh, but we were all, about four of us were investors with her from the onset. And she's brilliant, she's smart. She had a clear vision, which was what we invested in, in order to uh, get the school started. But two years after we started the school, she died. Mm. So when is the right time to start planning for succession? Because what saved us immediately, when she started, she had brought in Mrs. Ogaraku as her deputy head of school. Even though it was early stage of the school, but Mrs. Ogaraku, who is the head of school, knew the plan, was very aware of the vision because they were building it together. And when that unfortunate incident happened, the only reason we could read, because for all of us, the rest, uh, the four of us that were investors are not education people, we're not interested. Readily would have just sold the school as it is or just shut down and walked away. But it was easy for us to say, okay, Ms. Ogaraku, can you do this? You know, and she was ready to take on the challenge. And we thought, well, they, they were uh, five and six in trying to build the vision and that she could. And that's panned out because mm -hmm. she's been able to take the school forward with us being the business mind and she being the educational mind to, to be able to drive things forward. And we just moved to a permanent site uh this january and all of that so frankly anything can happen life happens mm. and in business at all times as long as you have a, a system running you should always consider what if someone is coming to work in the morning and that's the only person that can run a machine for you and gets knocked down by a car by a taxi or falls off bike or something 
what happens? For as long as that person is in Ugobi, is your workshop or your office shut down. That's, you need to think in such drastic manners to make you understand why succession across different levels of your business is important. Yes. If you have someone that can do something, make sure someone responsible for a key thing within your organization has someone else. They have yeah. taught how to do that when they're not there. So it's not just about CEO and just have for every role, key role, have a double, every key role. That is it. Every key role have a double. You must have a replacement on standby. Someone they're teaching will come and it must be built into your system. That's how you survive if you want to play for the long, long game. Absolutely. I could, I couldn't have said that better. Look at what happened. Uh, you know, the unfortunate situation that befell us in Nigeria recently with Herbert Wigwe and the yeah. Access, uh, yes. uh, Access Bank. Yeah. Yeah. Access Bank MD. But look at it. The university, as um, Indy mentioned it, most of us know Fabian um, um, Ajogu. And she mentioned it because Fabian, that people know he's on the board, We uh, everybody is convinced. She had, they, he had set up a very strong board. The university hasn't really started, but it's, it should be part of the DNA of your company, right from inception, because you cannot separate leadership development and your corporate strategies. You cannot. When you build the health, it's like you are nurturing a child, when you are feeding the child, you are doing everything for that child. You are thinking of that child surviving in future. You are not just going to feed the child for now. He's hungry, so I just give the child food for today. It is built in. So five years, my, madam, is already too late. You, it should be part, but it's never too late. That's why we're doing this. That's why I'm also you know, putting together the mastermind. It is already um, extra time. <laughs> so, and in developing that pipeline and your section plan, it takes up to one to three years. You need to build that internal capacity, that bench strength. It takes time. So please, let's get going if we haven't. Can we just stand in ovation, stand in ovation, stand in ovation thank for you. my thank sister. You. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's all we'll be able to take thank today. You. We're looking forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow we have Mrs. Funke Amba, Paula Amba, who is also, like Toyi Bakari, second generational uh, business owner who has yeah. taken over the school her mom started. It's an amazing story, amazing journey, an amazing woman. And I'm hoping to see all of you there. On Thursday, we have Mrs. Neka Uyali Ikpe, the MD of Fidelity Bank, an amazing lady as well, who would also look at it from the banking point of view. I'd, I'd love to know what, what happens at Fidelity Bank. You know, as we've heard about FCMB. And then the final day will be more of my own story and how we have family, we have non family members as part of the succession plan. Thank you so much once again, sis. Thank you. It's just been amazing. My pleasure. God continue to bless, keep you and everything you're involved in, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, everyone.